Our world is 70% ocean and only 30% land. Yet as a society, we're constantly focusing on that 30% land and forgetting about the ocean. A prime example of this can be seen in education. I went to school here locally on Grand Cayman from kindergarten through to my first two years of university, and we didn't study the ocean at all, and it was in our backyard. I then went to school in North America where I finished my education and asked many of my peers along the way if they studied the ocean, and the answer was no, or maybe a little bit here and there, but nothing substantial. And this idea really resonated with me. If our planet, if our planet is 70% water, then why aren't we learning more about it in schools? This lack of understanding and knowledge about the ocean is leading to an illiteracy as a society. We don't understand its most basic mechanisms or its vulnerabilities and its sensitivities, and that's impacting us and our utilization of this resource. This image is an image I really love. It shows the world upside down, and it allows you to see the world in a slightly different way, where you can really just see how much water there is compared to land. For many of us, land is our past, and it's our present. But is it our future? We live on land. We walk, and we talk, and we breathe on land. So it's only natural that we think about it more. But the Earth is 70% water. And that 70% is doing a lot more than most of us realize. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today, the untapped potential of the ocean. Now, to understand everything that the ocean has done for us, we need to go way back into when our planet first got water. It's thought that our planet first got water somewhere between 4.4 billion years ago and 150 million years ago. And while scientists aren't exactly sure how life came to be on our planet, if it started here or if it arrived extraterrestrially on a meteor or a comet. What is agreed on is that it was the presence of liquid water that allowed that first cell to flourish. That then led on to evolution when we see the development of fish and other mammals and then humans. So without water, there would be no life and there'd be no us here today. The life and the biodiversity that is present in our oceans is just astounding. We have the biggest animal on our planet, the blue whale, and we have some of the smallest animals, bacteria, also living in the ocean. Scientists study the animals in the ocean to understand different physiological traits, to understand how evolution occurs, how different species manage different habitats and different ways of life. They also look at studying the ocean to understand how life first survived on such a hostile environment. To do this, they look at hydrothermal vents, which are deep down at the bottom of the ocean floor in very hostile environments. The animals that are in our ocean provide us with many ecosystem services, such as oxygen. When we think of air and we think of breathing, we think of trees and we think of forests but 70% of the oxygen we have in our atmosphere came from marine plants. Little, tiny, single cellular plants are what gave us the air that we breathe today. But let's go back, let's talk about humans because after all, that's what we care about with the most. It's what we resonate with, we are human. 60% of all humans live within 60 kilometers of the coast. That means that more than half the planet is a day's drive to the ocean. So it's quite astonishing that we don't learn more about it in our school systems. Furthermore, 80% of all tourism takes place in a coastal area. This is a really important statistic for a place like Grand Cayman that relies heavily on a tourism economy. People want to be near the water and they want to utilize many of the things it has to offer. However, our current population growth is leading to a tremendous pressure being put on our planet. There are more people alive now than have ever been recorded before. This means we have to feed those people, we have to house those people, we have to have resources to build things for those people. And a lot of the places we're exploring to accommodate this need of resources is coming from the ocean. One of the best examples of this is food. We are currently in an age of exploration in terms of aquaculture. We've been farming things like sheep and pigs for thousands of years, since biblical times. 
And now we're in an age where we're learning how to farm a completely new species, and that's fish. It's quite controversial and it's not perfect yet, but the fact of the matter is we need aquaculture to take pressures off of our very overwhelmed oceans. Some of the other things that the ocean provides us with in terms of resources is fresh water. Desalination is the process of taking salty marine water and turning it into fresh drinking water. We do this locally on Grand Cayman and are one of the few places in the world that's independent for fresh water without having a river or a lake or a deep water aquifer. Other countries now are starting to utilize this technology, places such as California, which are currently building one of the largest desalination networks on our planet to accommodate fresh water needs for their people and for their industries. We also take a lot of resources from the ocean, resources such as hydrocarbons, oil and gas, precious metals like gold and silver and manganese, which are needed in our smartphones and our cars and most technological devices that are out there. And we also are using it for pharmaceuticals. A lot of drug and chemical companies are looking at different corals, marine species, bacteria, algae, seaweeds and kelps, for their nutritional benefits and for the chemicals and oils that are found in them. We have an example of this locally too. Maxi Cosmetics is currently harvesting Sea Whip, which is a soft coral, for its black rod oil, which is thought to make a woman's eyelashes grow longer. The creativity and the potential are truly unlimited, especially as we continue to explore what there is all out there. One of the biggest things we take for granted that the ocean does for us is transportation. 90% of all goods are shipped at some point in their manufacturing. That means that most of the things in this room wouldn't be here if it weren't for boats and if it weren't for the ocean. Transportation is slow and it's often taken for granted, but it's the best way that we have to transport big, bulky, heavy goods from one side of the ocean to the other. The ocean does so much for us. And as we develop science and technology, there truly is unlimited potential for the continued growth and discovery. Oceanography is only 200 years old. And in that short time, we've learned about tectonic plates, how the ocean current circulates around the globe, making our weather patterns and our climates. We've discovered countless species, including hydrothermal vents, which may be the secret to understanding how life first became. However, as mentioned earlier, pressures from our increasing population are putting strain on these resources. If we keep taking and discovering something else and taking that, and discovering something else and then taking that as well, what's gonna happen to our ocean? We need to make sure that we have proper management to ensure that these resources are accessible to the future generations. But our society's lack of marine education and basic knowledge is a hindering that. It's leading to intentional and unintentional harm to the oceans. Humans are very destructive. We have years since humans have been here, we have examples of how we pillage and we storm and we burn things and we pollute things. We are starting to see examples of this in the ocean with things like the Costa Concordia shipwreck that happened in the Mediterranean causing significant environmental damage. We have examples with oil spills, with oil tankers erupting or a pipe bursting deep underwater. And we've seen the collapse of certain fisheries that are now gone. We're not gonna get those back. But we still have time to prevent further harm. We can still prevent these sorts of disasters happening at a scale that might impact the ocean in its entirety. The ocean's all connected. One drop of water will literally circulate around the entire planet over the course of an 11 year cycle. So we can't think that one part of the ocean is not gonna impact the other, because it will. So we need to do our best to understand the ocean so that we can manage it better. Management is nothing new. We have management at work and we have it at home. We're told what to do and we're told how to do it. We're often told if we did it well or if we didn't do it so well. And we need to start taking that principle and applying it to the ocean. We're starting to see this a little bit with land. We have marine parks, game reserves, pollution controls. But 
managing the ocean is a little bit more complicated than managing land because it has one very big difference, and that is it's not really owned by any one country. Right now, you will see a map of the exclusive economic zones of the world. Every country is entitled to 200 nautical miles of territorial sea. This means that they can use that sea privately from any other country to research, to fish, to harvest resources, for shipping, to develop. But anything outside of that 200 nautical mile zone is international waters. It is open to absolutely anyone. So how do you manage something that's a commons, that doesn't have one particular owner? And the answer is it's very challenging and it's very complicated. We can use tools like marine protected areas, which are kind of like a game park, where you take a section of the ocean and protect it. We've had marine protected areas in Cayman now for more than 25 years, and that's a huge accomplishment. We're starting to see countries explore marine protected areas internationally in those open ocean waters and make treaties and as a different communities and say, you know what, we're going to protect that fish stock or we're not going to harm or mine a resource in that area. We also have law and policy in the United Nations which also come in handy. But the biggest tool and the most important tool we have for managing the ocean is you guys. It's education. It's having our community care about this resource to tell our governments and to tell those people making our laws and policies that this matters. And the best way to do that is through education. Education is our most powerful conservation tool. If you don't understand something, then how can you protect it? How can you know if what you're doing is right or if it's wrong? Therefore, I'm going to ask every single person in this room to start addressing that illiteracy that we have as a society. I want everyone to go home tonight and look up one fact about the ocean. The variety is truly unlimited. It could be an oceanographer, it could be a shipwreck, it could be a certain ecosystem or an animal. And then pass that fact on to a child in your life. It could be your own child, or a niece or a nephew, or the kid that you babysit every other Friday night. Passing on that one fact may then allow that child to go and learn one more. And then they might tell you that fact. We're going to start the conversation on understanding the ocean, that 70% of our planet. When enough people start talking about this, our school systems and our governments may take notice and make this education required in our school systems, which may then bring a, and cater to a new generation of marine biologists or oceanographers, who will then address all those different discoveries that are still yet to be made. Perhaps the cure for cancer, HIV, is in one of those pharmaceuticals just waiting to be discovered on the deep ocean floor. Education is our most powerful conservation tool. And our ocean truly has unlimited potential. But to make sure that those resources are there for future generations, we need to make sure that these resources are properly managed. And the way we need to do that is through addressing our illiteracy so that we know what the ocean sensitivities and vulnerabilities are. Thank you.